Hey, I'm Jen, and I love horror movies. I'm Mikey. I'm dead inside, and I also love horror movies. And we really like to torture our friend Todd because he hates horror movies. That I do. And that's why they call me the horror virgin. <laughs> that's the only reason we call him that. Yes. I'm not, no other reasons at all. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, wanky, all. Wanky. Whatever. So every, <laughs> <laughs> every week we take him through the encyclopedia of horror, the good, the bad, the ridiculously Jack Frosts. <laughs> and then we make fun of it more or less. Or explain its deceptive feminism. Oh. Yeah, exactly. That's what I do. That's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the funny one. <laughs> Our episodes drop on Monday, so check us out. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with... The interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. I always like to say hi to all of you all who uh, who subscribe to the series. I want to thank each and every one of you individually. Uh, leave me a message somewhere, wherever you're listening to this. Uh, reach out and tell me where you're listening from. Interviews you like or what you liked about the interviews, questions, some constructive criticism, any of that. Would love to hear from you. Leave those messages. Always appreciate it. If you're not a subscriber, of course, uh, I hope you take that moment to, uh, to hit that subscribe button. You can do so at iTunes, Apple Podcasts. You can do it at Spotify, even YouTube, really anywhere that you get your podcast from just type in Kyle Meredith with and subscribe and we'll deliver new episodes to you every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. It's a really great way to keep up with everything that's going on in music, uh, your favorite artists or artists that you've never heard of uh, introducing you to new music. Whatever the case, uh, I hope you keep up with us. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest, Des Rocks. Now, if you're a fan of rock and roll, you're going to be a fan of Des Rocks if you're not already. He's uh, he's It's still sort of new to the scene. Like, not even exactly two years has he been around yet. But he's already accomplished so much in getting a, uh, a humongous fan base, opening up for the Rolling Stones, sellout shows on tours. We're going to be talking about all of that. Starting with his history coming from the band Secret Weapons, which was a very different sound. It was a bit more synth poppy on that one. So I want to ask uh, what changed? What made him pick up that guitar? decide to be a front man, grab the torch of rock and roll, and run. So you get the whole backstory on that time and how it led to now. That also includes some self-isolation in Ecuador and upstate New York to write the record. And we'll do a little bit of hero worship, too. You know, you listen to his music, you're going to hear some Freddie, you're going to hear some Elvis. But as it turns out, Talking Heads is a big influence, too, uh, which allows us to geek out about David Byrne for just a bit. And we'll get into the songs like Out of My Mind and Used to Darkness. I want to hear about how he writes for his live show because he'll tell you that even as he's writing in his room, he's writing for the live show. And it makes sense. It's riffs. It's big riffs. And it's big riffs that landed him on the stage, as I mentioned, with the Rolling Stones. Although when the moment finally arrived, due to a wet stage, it also found him flat on his back. It's a really funny story. And pizza. If you follow Des Rocks online, you know he's a big fan of pizza. So we're also going to talk about pizza. In fact, as a, uh, a resident of New York, he's also going to tip us off on the best slice in town. So let's get into it. It's Kyle Meredith with Des Rocks. Hey, Kyle, how are you? Well, it's been uh, it's been awesome to hear you. I, I mean, I, I think this whole thing is still, you know, only a couple years old, so it still feels brand new to me. I'm sure it's maybe a little bit different for you, but you're producing some uh, a hell of a great music right now. You know, just congratulations on all of that. Oh, thank you so much, man. Yeah, it's been like a really crazy 20 months or so. It's been pretty nuts. How, and that's even sounds insane to say. It's like been 20 months, like... You know, to to go from I don't know if you'd actually say zero to sixty the way you have, but it feels like you know, in, in a certain way, like you came out of the gates and it just started. It looks like it just started happening. Was was that actually the perception on your end too? Uh, yeah, man. Well, I mean, to an extent, you know, uh, I spent so much time just dreaming up everything. Des Rock sitting alone in a little space in Brooklyn, a little tiny desk in a basement and uh, getting ready to put all the records out. So when I put out the first record, I had like a 50-year game plan for how everything wanted to unroll. And I just put out that first one. I had that little less than a 1,000 sign on Spotify the next day. But I just kept putting out records and records and records, and slowly but slowly it kind of built up. Well, let's get a bit of your history, too, because it's not exactly your first time through the machine. I mean, there was a little bit of history there with a, with a band called Secret Weapons. And it's fair to say that this ain't that. This is a completely different thing, right? 
Yeah, well, this isn't a collaboration. It's just kind of a creative dictatorship. It's just me completely raw and unfiltered in every possible way. My whole life, since I was 13 years old, I've been the guitar player in other bands and writing and producing and everything. Uh, but it was the first time I just set out and did exactly what was in my bones and didn't have really much other influence. So, so what was the turning point for you? Like, when did you decide, hey, listen, I want to be the front man. I, I want to do my own thing. When did that happen? And, and was there any catalyst? Uh, it was about 2017. And I had been on the road for many years, you know, in a van, driving all day, all night, all across this country. And the other half of my band, unfortunately, uh, we were a duo and he became very sick and he couldn't tour anymore. And he said, uh, you know what? The last few years wasn't for nothing. You got to just do your own thing now. And that was really the impetus for me dreaming up everything Des Rocks. So dreaming it up, I mean, it seems like, you know, I mean, even using the name Des Rocks, I, I don't know. I don't know if persona is the right word because this seems like really real, but like, is there that thought that goes into it, too? Like, when I think of the greatest artists of all time, there is there, there's something extra. There is a persona there, whether it's Bowie, whether it's Elvis, whoever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, it's like about uh, an exaggeration of oneself. And even Des Rocks is kind of a bizarre world version of my real name. And it's about inhabiting something in your art and stage that is a piece of you, but just amplified like a thousand times. And I feel like in that amplification comes the show and comes the record and, and comes everything else. Now, do you, did you have any like uh, early trouble like conjuring the bravado it takes to become that? No, because ever since I was like a, a three-year-old, I've always just wanted to be on the biggest stage possible. And I really came up in a scene in Brooklyn where everyone was kind of making synth pop and being too cool for school. And I've just been making rock and roll records and big records my whole life, really. And I never really fit in here. And I always wanted to play arenas and stadiums without any shame. And everybody wanted to play clubs. Uh, so it's something I've wanted to do my entire life, you know. I love that. And, and you have a sound that, that fills up that, that room, as far as I can tell anyway. You know, I feel one of the biggest losses uh, to rock has been the riff. It seems like a lot of people aren't trying that, even if they are playing rock. I, I don't know if it's got lazy or, or if it's just the trends shifted, but but that's that's like your mark right there. Like, you are centered in on the riff. And I don't know, is there any reason there? Thanks, man. I mean, I think a riff is just the most, like, primal expression of, of oneself musically, to just kind of hammer on something over and over again with slight variation like that is so primal and uh i think it's super important but for me you know it's like there's been so much of that in music history and i'm just obsessed with how i push it forward and expand upon the greats not paying homage to the greats for me it's all about modernizing every aspect of rock and roll challenging every aspect of rock and roll asking why with every part of the process and pushing it and dragging it, kicking and screaming to the 21st century. <laughs> so I don't know if you can answer this, if it's too broad of a question, but but sort of what is the answer to what you're saying that? what, How did you modernize it? What was the next step? The first step is realizing that there are no rules in anything. I feel like every other genre has had that moment where they're just like, there's no rules. There's no rules production-wise. There's no rules songwriting. And once you throw that all out the window you're completely free to do whatever you want. And secondly, I think just taking big swings creatively. You know, I think you got to just go for shit, and that's going to have a certain degree of modernity if you're not playing it safe and staying with traditional song structures, traditional production choices. Um, and then third, as I was just saying, I think it's the production, man. Like, you got to just get weird. You got to push. You got to mess around. You got to feel uncomfortable with the production choices, and then I think you're ready to do something different and unique, worthy of being out there. As I read some of the press release, I see Ecuador played some role in all of this, too. How, how important was a trip down there? Oh, man, I, I did a lot of recording down there, and I'd done a lot of recording also upstate and just kind of alone. I think a lot of the records are born from the sense of loneliness and isolation. So getting off the grid is pretty invaluable to my process. It seemed like, I mean, I, I don't know if Ecuador has any importance beyond you going to record there, but... But that's, you know, versus like New York in that area, it, it's, it's, it seems like it's worlds apart from, you know, a place to be lonely in. Yeah, totally. And it's just so crazy to, to take a beat that you made on a subway in Queens and then bring it to Ecuador and record it and then mix it in New Jersey. You know what I mean? And it's, like, it's just this kind of uh, unique process by which a Des Rocks record is made and that I think is so crucial to everything I want to do. And hearing you talk about some of these influences, I, I think the one that kind of, um, you know, some of them you're like, OK, yeah, I can definitely hear that. But you talk about the talking heads a lot, too, like as being sort of uh, something that you've been into. And, and I thought maybe that's not as obvious to me, at least. 
What is about Talking Heads, and, and how far does that go back for you? Uh, the Talking Heads is hugely influential, um, and I think the core of that influence is in a certain quirkiness and disregard for whatever is cool and trendy and just really being true to oneself. And then also really pushing the visual medium. And I haven't even begun to really make any of the Des Rocks videos yet that I'm going to be making this year. And I couldn't be more excited to do that. And I think that's really where a Talking Heads influence comes into play. But we're not exactly talking about you putting on the big shoulder suit or something like that. <laughs> no, no. But, you know, just the, the, the element of risk taking. And at right. that time, like, that's just bat shit crazy. And uh, I think it's just so cool to think about. You know? Yeah, I mean, David Burns, a local uh, to to your area. Do, do you have any history with him personally? Have you met him? Not personally, but I did see a show on Broadway a couple of weeks ago, and his guitar player is a friend of mine. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, I'm just I'm obsessed, man. Obsessed. Yeah, it's it's amazing what he's done uh, with this whole setup. I've seen it in a couple different variations. Of course, recently with uh, the SNL performance too. It's just it's just great what he's doing. Oh, it's awesome. And what I think is so cool about an artist that established is that he'll go on SNL and play a hit from 35 years ago, and then he'll also play a new song. And it kind of all makes sense. Right. You know, he, the new stuff is good. The old stuff is obviously incredible and legendary. But he can mix the old and new. He doesn't have to rely on one or the other. Uh, let yeah. me hit on some of the songs, too. You know, kind of focusing on uh, Out of My Mind recently that that song seems to when i listen to it 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 almost sounds like it's tracing your rise is that kind of the direction (laughs) it's going uh yeah i mean like uh lyrically i would say that that one and a lot of the records speak to the torture of the process of making records and doing what we do as recording artists so it's like yeah i'm out of my mind Uh, this is hell and this is everything i love you know is the opening lyric of that one and I think that really sets the tone for a lot of what's to come. As a writer, I mean, you, you seem to be a writer who likes to write about writing. It's it's the singer who likes to write about the songs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just the process in general, because that is my life. And that is, you know, when I'm writing about my life, which is the process of, of making rock and roll records in 2020. And for me, it's a very painful and tortured process. There's a lot of just walking around New York City alone at three or four in the morning uh, and just thinking and going over ideas and concepts and relaying it to songs and music. And it's like a really, uh, it's something that I take so seriously and so personally that it really weighs heavily on me, all these records do. When I listen to that one too, I mean, I haven't looked at your set lists or anything, but I'm like, that sounds like a great opener. That's a great way to start a show right there. So I, I, I would wonder, like, do you write uh, with that in mind? Do you think about where it can go in the live show while you're writing? I am constantly thinking about uh, how a record fits into the show. And strangely, when I'm writing, I'm writing as if I'm on stage. You know, like that guides everything. Because for me, the show is so, so important. And I want to be able to, in the middle of that song, raise my fist to 80,000 people and have them scream along, you know. So, yeah, that's so important. You know, there's a fun history to that, too, whether it's, uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Like, I remember Dan Wilson talking about writing closing time for Semisonic as the idea, like, oh, we need something to close the show with, so I, I, I will write this. You know, it's sort of that idea. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, man. Like, I, I like things that people can all sing along to and that unites an audience. That, to me, gives me chills as a, as a recording artist and a performer. So that's what I'm constantly thinking about. Well, that relation to, uh, I'll hit another song here with Used to Darkness, because like maybe that's talking about something very personal, but I feel like that's a song that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to, especially in 2020. Like This seems like it's something beyond the songwriter writing about songs. This seems like it's something speaking to a bigger subject. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's both personal and more macro than that. You know, I was that song very much is rooted in that time when I was on the road for all those years and that my other half got really sick and couldn't tour anymore. And then at the same time, like, you know, uh, the, the world was just kind of turning upside down and there was a certain desensitization to such horrible circumstances. And that's what that song is really about. That's a powerful moment. That one right there. Ah, really thanks. Is. I'm going to wrap it up here with some lighter stuff too. I don't know if this is the goal, but there is a chance that uh, at some point, if you keep on pushing it, people are just going to start bringing pizza to your shows if they're not already. <laughs> I think it'll be a thing. 
Uh, oh, that's already a thing. Already a thing, my man. Yeah. Are they bringing it? Yeah. Are they bringing it for you? Yeah, man. I'm gonna gain three thousand pounds in the next tour, dude. Every I, second I get off stage, everyone starts handing me slices of pizza, man. It's crazy. What do you, what do you call it? Like self prophesizing or something? When you put something in motion to hope it'll happen, like if you talk about it enough, it'll start getting there. Oh man, yeah. I just I think I can. I think I can, and now I don't have to buy dinner on tour. It's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, man, pizza is a huge part of my <laughs> huge part of my existence. Um, I literally ate a slice of pizza from Paul G's about 15 minutes ago here in Brooklyn. <laughs> and uh, for better or for worse, I can't help who I am. I, I should ask this question. I'm in New York a lot. Where where mm-hmm. do I need? Is, the, is what you just mentioned, is that where I need to go? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you're looking for what I think is the best slice, look no further than Paul G's Pizza in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Shout out to my homie over there. It's as good as it gets. Yeah. All right, noted. Absolutely. And and you opened up for the Rolling Stones. Among many big moments in the last couple of years, you were one of the openers for the Stones. Which tell me about that experience because that can't be just like any other show. Yeah, man. No, it was absolutely insane. And you know, I'm like unsigned too. You know, so it was crazy to just have that kind of come in the inbox. But uh, yeah, man. So you know, it was a show that I was preparing for pretty much my entire life. When we got offered the gig, we had about a month to go, and I spent every single day rehearsing for hours and hours and hours, even without the band. I'm in this little 100-square-foot space in a, uh, like an abandoned warehouse in Brooklyn that we kind of just took over, and I just had to like tape out a fake stage that was 10 times the size of the stage that uh, I, the space that I had. And I'd be like running down the hallways and the stairwell to simulate the stage. And, uh, you know, I'm rehearsing, I'm rehearsing, I'm rehearsing, I'm rehearsing, and I'm getting ready to go on. And it starts to drizzle a little bit, like right before I go on stage. And the stage manager runs up to me while my intro music is playing. And he says, Dad, I got to tell you, the stage, like if it gets wet, it's more slippery than black ice. And I was like, what? Okay, okay. Stage is wet. Got it, got it. And I ran out on stage as I had been rehearsing every single day, all day for four weeks. And I get out there, and on my first step, my legs come up, and I am vertical and uh, to the ground, and I crash on the ground in front of 80,000 people. <laughs> and uh, it was the craziest moment of my life, and I kind of just came to a moment later on my back staring up at the sky and just kind of seeing water droplets come down. And I think everyone in the crowd was like, Ugh, you know, a big collective gas. And then I got right back up and everyone screamed and then we did the show. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty insane moment. I thought I broke my hip. Thank God I didn't. And it was a fun show, man. It was crazy. Oh, man. I mean, seriously, because as an opener for any band, but especially as a band like the Stones, like you've got to, you know, as an opener, you have to work so hard because they didn't come for you. It's it's that whole that whole scenario. So, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's an accidental moment, but at least all eyes are where you want them to be at that point, you know. Oh, I got their attention, you know. I'm going to get it one way or another when I'm playing a show. I'm going to get everybody, and uh, I just happened to do it in a strange way that day. <laughs> awesome, man. Des, it's a, yeah. such a pleasure talking to you. Let's see, the uh, the latest EP came out uh, in November called Margaret Parade. Uh, are, are there more releases planned for this year? Oh, I've got a lot of releases planned for this year. All the music is done, and we're just starting to roll it out in about a month or two. And there's so much to come. I can't wait to share it with you guys. Awesome. I can't wait to hear it. Uh, thank you so much for what you've given so far. Des, thank you for the call today. Thank you. Thanks for your time, man. All right. Take care. You too. Bye. Ah, my thanks. Des rocks. Again, that latest EP came out in November. It's called Martyr Parade. Sounds like there's plenty on the way as well. Looking forward to that. Thanks to Des. Thanks to you for checking out the episode. Before you get out of here, uh, leave us a comment or review to the series uh, if you can do that as well. Or if you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button. Again, you can do it at Spotify or uh, iTunes, Apple Podcasts. You can also subscribe at YouTube or anywhere you get your podcast from. Just type in Kyle Meredith with and subscribe from there. After that, head to WFPK.org where I do a show at 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres and music news and anniversary spins and bonus interviews. Again, that's wfpk.org. Consequenceofsound.net has your music and film news. You can also find me on just about any social media platform at Kyle Meredith. Hope you follow along there as well. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.
Consequence Podcast Network. It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org from Louisville Public Media.